Um, why don't you grab your Bibles, uh, open them to, we're actually going to just kind of pause from Hebrews just for this week since a lot of people are, are, um, are not here. We're going to look at Acts chapter 18. And so I want you to turn to that. Acts chapter 18. I'm going to read it, read it for you, and then I'll pray. So this is the text we're going to look at this morning. God's word says this, after, after this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. And he found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife, Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, and because he was of the same trade, he stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. And he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath and tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. When Silas and Timothy arrived from Macedonia, Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews that the Christ was Jesus. And when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments and said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. For from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. And he left there and went to the house of a man named uh, Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, believed in the Lord together with his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. And the Lord said to Paul one night in a vision, Do not be afraid, but go on speaking, and do not be silent. For I am with you, and no one will attack you to harm you, for I have many in this city who are my people. And he stayed a year and six months, teaching, in the, word, teaching the word of God amongst them. But when Gallio was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul and brought him before the tribunal, saying, This man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, Gallio said to the Jews, If it were a matter of wrongdoing... Or vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your, comp- your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal, and they all seized Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, and beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of this. This is God's word. Father, as we... Uh, Spend some time looking at this passage, Lord, that you, uh, according to your infinite, eternal, sovereign knowledge, decided to to record and write down for us. God, we first of all just acknowledge that these these are not bedtime stories. These are not fairy tales. These are not parables. These are real historical events that took place. And, and, And you saw fit. God, you saw fit to make sure they were recorded by Dr. Luke and and written down for us in this two-part volume, Luke Acts, Lord, that we get to open this morning and interact with. So God, what what is it that you have here for us this morning? Lord, would you lead us and guide us into that? And we pray most of all that that Jesus, you would be worshiped and glorified uh, through the exposition of scripture. And Lord, as we we roll these verses around and we ask questions of them, God, would you manifest yourself here, glorify yourself here, and and shape us to think like you, Jesus. We pray all that in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. I want to talk about discouragement in ministry this morning. Um, You might be saying, I'm I'm not in ministry. Um, Yes, you are. Okay, if you're a Christian, you're in ministry. There's this, this thing called the Great Commission, which is to go into all the world <coughs> excuse me, and make disciples of all nations. And guess who the Great Commission was for? It was for everybody, for every believer, okay, for every Christian. So if you're a Christian, you're conscripted into the mission of the kingdom of God, which is to make disciples. That is uh, really, you could, you, could, you could define discipleship this way. It's, it's life change. It's life transformation. It's to bring people into conformity with the thinking and the will of Christ to the mind of Jesus. And we all are called into this, this work of disciple making. But here's the thing about discipleship. It's, it's incredibly discouraging sometimes. Can anybody agree with that? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you, sometimes you, you just put time and effort and work and prayer and emotional bandwidth and emotional health and, and, and you put it all into this person and sometimes it just doesn't pan out. Sometimes you don't get the results 
that you want. I remember when I first started ministry, I, I got saved at 17 and immediately went into starting to work with some of the rough, kind of rough and tumble youth in the city where I, gr- where I grew up and kids that were, you know, in and out of juvenile hall. And, and I just dove right into ministry. I had a very idealistic kind of idea of what ministry was. Like, well, I'm just going to show up and I'm going to tell them about Jesus and they're just going to like weep and get saved and life change and they're going to stop doing meth and then they're going to stop stabbing each other and it's going to be awesome. These are rough kids. I'm not, this isn't like church kids. These were rough kids. And uh, so we started showing up to the juvenile halls and we started inviting all these these kids to um, to the spaghetti feed and it was like, um, you know, you know no, no smoking weed in the backyard, like, you know, lots lots of just craziness like that. I was very idealistic. I thought, you know, I'm just going to show up and things are going to happen and it's going to be incredible. And, and things did happen. Kids got saved. I remember one time piling like 30 kids into, uh, into a bunch of SUVs to take them up to Applegate. I, I lived down in Wairika at the time. I'd take them up to Applegate Christian Fellowship to get them baptized because they wanted to get baptized. And, um, and I told a few kids, I was like, hey, show up at Ray's Food Place and we'll, we'll go up to Applegate and get baptized. I, I was thinking two or three would come. And instead, like 30 kids showed up. And I was like, oh, my goodness, like, I'm going to need more cars. So I'm, like, calling all these people. Can you drive a bunch of hoodlums up to, you know, uh, to Roosh, Oregon so they can get back? Like, okay, you know. And um, So we get them all in the car. And then as we're driving over the border, I remember one of the kids goes, hey, don't get pulled over, bro. I was like, why? He's like, I'm not supposed to leave, or, uh, I'm not supposed to leave California. <laughs> I was like, are you kidding me, dude? You're not supposed to leave. Like, well, it's all for Jesus, whatever, you know. Like, here we go. So... Anyway, so it was this just crazy thing. It was an amazing time. Everything was just like happening. And all these kids seemed like they were getting saved. And at that time, if you had asked me, I'd be like, man, ministry is real easy. You just show up. You tell them about Jesus. You give them the gospel. You pray for them. You know, you, you, you're there with them. I mean, I just remember showing up at Juvenile Hall on Sunday, kids just weeping on my shoulder, you know, in their sweatpants and Velcro shoes because they got busted the night before at a party. Just like so open, so broken. And then, and then a lot of that work started to unravel over the course of the next couple of years. And, and uh, sorry if this is depressing, but, you know, probably about 80% of those kids that got baptized walked away from Jesus. They stopped following Christ. They went back into their drug addiction and their, uh, their violence and their crime. And um, some of them would, you know, complete, I walked past some of them on the street. It's like, hey, you know, how's it going? This, this kid that was weeks later, you know, crying on my shoulder, completely ignore me. You know, they just completely denied and rejected Christ. One of the kids, I remember, uh, within a year, he was, he was so on fire for Jesus, was talking about going into ministry, wanted to be a pastor. Within a year, he had stabbed a kid in Hawthorne Park, and I think he's still doing prison time for it. I mean, it was very, so I had to wrestle with all that, right? Now, there were still some, some of those kids that really are following Christ, right? But a large majority of them weren't. And I had to really wrestle. It was discouraging. It was really frustrating for me to go, man, what in the world? Like, what did we do wrong? Like, what did we pour out? We, what, what, what happened? And the reality is, is that, that discipleship and life change is extremely hard. Extremely hard because only God can do it. And, and, and you can't make it happen. And it can be discouraging. Now, some of you guys um, are raising kids right now, or you have raised kids, and you're trying to disciple your children, and, and you're trying to teach them these things, and sometimes they just don't want it. Some of you have kids right now that are grown, and they're not following Christ. They've rejected the gospel. And you're, what did, I, what did I do wrong? I mean, I did all the things I knew how to do, and it's discouraging. Some of you have unbelieving spouses, and you're constantly putting the gospel before them. You're trying to minister to them, and they just don't want it. It's discouraging. It's, it's, it's frustrating at times. Why, why is discipleship so hard? Let me give you a few reasons. First of all, um, you can make rules, but you can't make people change. Have you noticed that? Um, you, you can give truth, but you can't produce belief. And there's a difference between knowledge and belief. You, you can, um, you know, the, 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 the world... This is important. The world has done way more to disciple people than you could possibly imagine. So when we do discipleship, we are forming Christ in people, but we're reforming what has already been deformed. You realize that we're not only being discipled by Christ, we've been discipled by the world. Every time you turn on the TV, every time you get on your smartphone, every, you've been discipled by the world. And discipleship is the un discipleship of the world and the reforming of Christ. And there's a lot of that to be done. Uh, it's, it's hard because we're far less patient and sacrificial than we'd like to believe. It's hard because uh, in leadership, people tend to idolize you and then they end up demonizing you. That's, that's a reality of leadership. It's hard because life change takes way longer than we think it should, doesn't it? It's often two steps forward, one step back. It's hard because humans are far more complex than we could possibly imagine. And sin is far more deep and wrapped around the affections of our heart than we could possibly imagine. Discipleship is hard. 
Ministry is hard. Now, our text this morning applies to this. And, and I, I thought this was fitting this morning because if you were here last week, we, we looked at Hebrews and it talked about endurance and it talked about the, 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 uh, the intent of continuing to run the race of faith. And I thought, you know, but what about when you're discouraged? It just reminded me of Acts chapter 18. And I, this, this passage, I think, has great significance for us and for, for those of us that maybe are feeling discouraged or maybe might someday feel discouraged in ministry because Paul, the apostle, is on a missionary trip. He's on a second missionary journey. Uh, if you, if you don't need to go there now, but if you eventually want to go to your Bible maps, you'll see, uh, you know, three different lines uh, that, that are th- the three different missionary journeys of Paul. And they're all recorded in the book of Acts. And so here in Acts chapter two, 18, we're dropping into the second missionary journey. And don't think like a two-week missionary trip. This was like multiple years that Paul would have been gone with, with his, his team doing ministry. And if you were to jump in right now and just begin to read uh, the book of Acts, you would start to notice that up until this point, things have not been going super well for the apostle, for the apostle Paul. I mean, he's had it rough. There's been some discouraging ministry. Now, on top of that, overlaid over that, there's been some great victory. There's been some churches planted. Acts chapter 16, the church that we named ourselves after, Philippi was planted, right? There's been great ministry happening. People have come to Christ. Lydia and the, 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 the Philippian jailer and all of this cool stuff. But overlaid on top of that is really discouraging stuff too because the both, come, they, the both things come together. So here's what's been happening in the life of Paul recently. Uh, first, he got the snot beat out of him in Acts chapter 16 in Philippi, illegally. Paul was a Roman citizen. He shouldn't have been treated the way he was. Uh, he was beat up, him and Silas, thrown into prison. Uh, so, so that wasn't good. They, they left Philippi having planted a very healthy church, but really pretty physically beat down. Uh, and, and emotionally, no doubt, beat down and dragged. They entered into Thessalonica, and then they had to leave and escape for their life. Barely, these, um, these Judaizers were sort of following Paul from town to town as he was trying to plant churches, um, trying to start riots and get people to try to beat him up and get him arrested. So everywhere Paul went, he was just being followed around by these, these people that were out to get him. Uh, he had a forced departure from Berea after that. And then he, he drops into Athens. And Athens was, a, was, if you guys know, this was like the thought center, the philosophical center of the ancient world. And he goes up onto Mars Hill. And guess what? They mocked him. They called him a seed picker. They called him they, they call a babbler. They, they said, who is this Jewish man who thinks he can come into Athens and, and, and correct us, right? So we don't know of any converts. There was certainly no church planted that we're aware of in Athens. So Paul leaves there sort of a little discouraged. He's on his own. He left his, his team behind, um, and they're going to reconvene here with him in a moment. But you know, Paul enters into the next city, I would imagine, pretty discouraged. Pretty discouraged. Physically tired. Emotionally exhausted, feel, feeling beat down, run down, talked down to. I mean, just all of the things that you can imagine. He enters into this city called Corinth. You guys ever read the book of Corinthians? Okay, the book of Corinthians, first and second, was written to the church that Paul planted right here in Acts chapter 18. This is one of the cool things about the New Testament. We get to read about how the church was planted, and then we get to go and read what Paul later would write to those churches. So Acts 18 is Paul planting the church in Corinth, and he is, again, he's coming in very discouraged. And what we're going to see this morning is we're going to see not only how Paul managed to continue to endure through the struggles and the frustrations of ministry, but more importantly, guys, we're going to see how Christ ministered to his apostle, Jesus, or to Paul. Because Jesus is sustaining Paul. He's sustaining Paul through this. He's graciously and kindly going to provide for Paul what he needs, the sustenance that he needs, the energy that he needs in order to, to, to plant this church in Corinth. Now, in 1 Corinthians 3.10, you don't need to turn there. I just want to read it for you. In 1 Corinthians 3.10, Paul would later say to the Corinthians, he would say, according to the grace of God given to me, like a skilled master builder, he's talking about his church planting strategy. He said, I laid a foundation and someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he builds upon it. So I, I, I read that because I want you to see that Paul, when he planted the church at Corinth, he was very happy about how he did it. And we know also from Corinthians that the foundation that he laid was what? It was Christ. It was the gospel. 
Okay, that was the foundation. So Paul is, is, is happy with the foundation. Well, the question is, how was Paul able to lay this foundation and plant a church being so beat down, so run down, so discouraged? So that's kind of going to be our premise that we're going to wrestle with as we work back through the text this morning. Let me give you an outline that you can follow. I'm going to give you 10 ways to burn out in ministry. So if that's your goal, write those down. 10 ways to burn out and to uh, ultimately wash out of, of ministry. Ten ways to do that. And I'll just note them as we kind of work our way through the narrative passage. Okay? So that's our outline. Let's just dive right back into the text. Acts chapter 18, verse 1. After this, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Let's just pause there for a moment. Corinth uh, is, um, as far as worldly standards go, it would have been... Uh, one of the best places to live. One of the, one of the most affluent, it's the largest city uh, in, in Greece, population of, at the time of about 750,000, which isn't that big for our day, but for then it was a pretty big uh, metropolis area. Corinth was highly pagan, highly Greek, Greco-Roman. Um, it was a very sinful place. It was a port city. Port cities, have you noticed, tend to be oftentimes very sinful. Uh, why? Because there's a lot of influence coming in. There's a lot of trade. There's a lot of people that, that, are, that are coming in and bringing all kinds of different things. So Corinth was very much like your San Francisco, Seattle, uh, New York City, kind of this melting pot place where there's a lot of trade and a lot of money and a lot of affluence and a lot of sin. A lot of things for sailors to do in the evenings, if you will. And so Paul is very aware of Corinth, and he knows that he's ultimately planning on going to Corinth. Um, but Corinth is going to pose a real um, set of challenges for him. Now, we know from um, digging up Corinth, we know that there was this thing there called the Acro Corinth. It's this temple on this big flat hill right outside of Corinth. And um, on this temple or in this temple it would have been thousands of temple prostitutes. The Greeks really loved to amalgamate sex with their worship, um, as most humans do. So they, they created this very, very sinful environment of, of um, yeah, uh, of, of, of prostitution within their worship. So uh, Cor Corinth was a dark place is kind of what I'm trying to get at here. It was a dark place. It was an immoral place. But Paul picked it. And he picked it because Paul had a strategy, a very good strategy of church planting. His strategy was to go to the urban centers first and to establish a beachhead in those urban centers. And then what they would do is once they would establish a church there, then they would send out missionaries from that urban center to the more rural areas. So that's what he did in Ephesus. That's what he does here in Corinth. That's what he does in Philippi. It's, it's sort of a, a, a beachhead, a landing point for, for troops to sort of be sent in. So Paul picks Corinth because of its strategic location, because of its darkness. And now it's this, it's this point I want you to get the first way to burn out in ministry, if you want to write it down. The first way to burn out in ministry is don't see the redemptive potential of the space that you have been placed in. Okay? Don't see the redemptive potential. Paul could have looked at Corinth and been like, wow, that's, that's not a very ethical place. That's not a very moral place. That's not a very conservative place. I'm going to go to the Bible Belt, right? I'm not going to go to Seattle. I'm not going to go to Grants Pass. Like, that's, that's too dark. Paul could have seen that as, as a place to avoid because it was too dark. But rather, Paul, strategically, because he was a missionary, because he was trying to build the kingdom of God through discipleship, he's like, that's exactly where I want to be, is Corinth. So one of the ways that we burn out in ministry is when we see and we look around, and maybe we can't relate with this at all, uh, we look around our culture and we see a bunch of immorality, we see a bunch of debauchery, we see a bunch of brokenness and a bunch of hurt, and we see uh, a bunch of just really gnarly stuff in our community, and we go, ah, oh, I just want to go to the south. Okay, but think about Paul's mindset here. Is Paul's mindset, I want to go be in the most moral place I can be. Whereas Paul's mindset, I want to go be in the darkest place I can be because it's in the darkest place that the light shines the brightest. Now, this isn't just true of our city, although, you know, things are going to get worse. And, and I think at the end of the day, we can either go, oh, I want to go somewhere that's more comfortable, or we can go, uh, I'm going to stay here because this is where God's put me, and I'm going to be a kingdom beachhead, a kingdom outpost in Grants Pass. We're going to bring the gospel into these dark places. Things are going to get worse, okay? Okay. Um, we need to see not only in our city, but we need to see also in the environment that God has placed you. And God popped you into a, a, a place that could be a family system, 
It could be the kids that you have in your life. That could be the, the, the influence, the, the kind of ecosystem that God has put you in. It could be the workplace that you're in, the, the work environment that you're in. It could be the neighbors that you're in. It doesn't matter. God puts you where you are. And if you want to burn out in ministry, just focus on the, 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 how uncomfortable and how frustrating and how dark and how sinful whatever environment that you are in, rather than seeing the redemptive potential of it, rather than seeing that God actually wants to do something really cool here. Corinth ended up being a phenomenal strategic place for the gospel, even though it was dark. So we have to choose whether to see uh, the messy spaces we inhabit as opportunities or liabilities. I would say, uh, with wisdom, they're opportunities more than they are liabilities. Look at verse 2. Now, he found, he enters into Corinth from Athens. He found a Jew named Aquila, a native of Pontius, recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla. So we have Aquila and Priscilla. Can you guys say Aquila and Priscilla? Just want to just make sure you're awake. Okay, Aquila and Priscilla. You're probably familiar with these two. Pretty dynamic couple by the way, pretty dynamic ministry couple. Um, now, be, they, they uh, came from Italy with his wife Priscilla because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. And he went to see them, uh, Paul did, because he was of the same trade. He stayed with them and worked for they were tent makers by trade. Yeah, I love this kind of Bible. You know, a lot of times Bible, it's like very theological or ethereal. I love this is just like gritty real life details. Paul rolls into Athens. Guess what? Paul's a tent maker. That's how he paid for his missionary journeys. He didn't raise money for his missionary journeys. He didn't send out little letters, you know. Not that there's anything wrong with that, but he, he, he funded himself. He was taught to do this as a Pharisee. Pharisees were required to have a way of funding their work, their ministry. So Paul learned a trade. He was a, it could have been tents. It could have just been leather work. We don't really know. Some kind of leather work that Paul was in. And this is, so he would pick up jobs along the way. And, and uh, when he enters into Corinth, he hears about a couple, Aquila and Priscilla, who happen to have the same trade as him. So he goes into a little partnership with them, and they start making probably tents together. Now, Aquila and Priscilla, super interesting couple, right? These guys were, uh, they were basically refugees at this moment. They're Jews that were part of the diaspora, meaning they were dispersed throughout the world. A lot of the Jews were just dispersed throughout the world. And they, they, they were from Pontius, it's where they kind of grew up, but they had resided in Italy, probably Rome. It says Rome, actually. And what happened was there was a, some kind of an uprising in Rome, and somehow it got, uh, history tells us, somehow it was, it was led by someone named Crestus. And uh, as far as we understand, they assumed that because this person's name was Crestus, it sounds like Christ, that it was the Christians that were behind this uprising. So what happened was at a certain point, Rome booted all the Christians out of Rome. Sayonara. So, uh, so, so these guys, Aquila and Priscilla, they basically had to flee from Rome because they got kicked out and they landed in Corinth. That's where they're at temporarily. Okay, and these are Jewish Christian tent makers. Perfect companions for Paul. So Paul interacts with these guys. They become friends. They, they, uh, they begin to make tents uh, t- together. They become really later in the, the Bible, we'll see very helpful companions to Paul. So here's, here's number two, if you want to write it down. Second way to burn out. Don't surround yourself with Christ's community partnership. Partnerships. Don't surround yourself with Christ's community partnerships. Here's the thing. You know, Jesus knew that Paul had left his team behind. Jesus... Paul had a, a ministry team. He left them behind. I think back in uh, Philippi or Thessalonica, I can't remember. He left them behind, and he kept going alone, and he goes into Corinth alone. And so Christ very compassionately delivers a ministry team from Corinth to come around and support uh, the Apostle Paul, and it's this couple, Aquila and Priscilla. It's so important. You know, Christians are meant to be together, right? We're meant to be together. Um, th- this, is, this, is, this is just basic, fundamental, and I, I probably have this conversation with people more than any other, you know, well, I, I'm a Christian, but I just don't go to church because I just don't think I need to. I can read my Bible, uh, I, the, the, the church is the woods for me. I go out of the woods, and I, and I meet Jesus out there, and I'm, and I'm like, okay, yeah, I, I think you can meet Jesus in the woods, and I'm glad you read your Bible, but, but here's the thing. Um, you don't get to decide the mechanism by which God created for you to grow. You don't get to decide the, 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 the makeup of what a Christian life is because you didn't make yourself a Christian. Jesus chose you. Jesus called you. Jesus put you into his body. And he said, the way you're going to operate in Christian life is in a body. You're part of a body. 
okay? And you guys make fires very often. We have a fireplace in my house, and I love to get up in the morning and just make a little fire. And, uh, and, and the reality is, if you notice in fire making, is that if, if the sticks are not close enough together, if the coals are not close enough together, the fire goes out. It's just the reality. That's a very simple analogy, but it's exactly true of Christians, it's exact. When we're not together, we burn out. When we're not together, we fizzle out. When we're together, we stoke the flames of one another's faith. We grow. We encourage each other. So what I love about this text is that Jesus is like my boy, Paul. He needs people around him that are going to minister the gospel, that are going to encourage him in Christ. So he brings Aquila and Priscilla all the way from Rome, and they just so happen to have the same trade, and they're sitting there making tents nine to five, and they're talking about Jesus. Isn't that cool? They're talking about Christ. Hey, Pass me the whatever leather workers do, you know. Hey, pass me the all or whatever the thing is, you know, the, the stamp. Pass me the whatever. Uh, you know, hey, by the way, isn't it crazy, like, the resurrection? And isn't it cool how Jesus came and died? I mean, they're just, like, they're ministering to one another in the everyday stuff of life. Isn't that cool? I love how earthy that is. It's very just common, very, very lifelike kind of a scenario. Uh, by the way, Hebrews, we just covered this. Hebrews 10, 24 reminds us, uh, let us consider how to stir up one another. Who is that? It's the church, the body. Let us consider how to stir up one another. In other words, let's, let's actually put some significant thought and planning and intentionality into how we are going to stir one another up to what? To love and to good works. In other words, how are we going to encourage one another to follow Jesus more uh, thoroughly? Not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So I'm so thankful that you guys got up this morning and came here. You came here to be with your family, to be with the body, to be encouraged, and to encourage someone else. So the second way to, be, uh, to burn out in ministry is don't, don't surround yourself with Christ's community partnerships. By the way, some advice for you. Build friendships around mission. Build friendships around serving Jesus primarily. Most of us, what we tend to do is we build, uh, we build relationships off of hobbies or similarities. Oh, this person's really into snowboarding, or this person's really into that, or this person just so happens to, you know, uh, be at the same place as me at this time. Okay, that's fine, but the, the relationships that are going to really stand the test of time are people you do ministry with. People that you talk about Jesus with. People that you need those relationships. You need missional relationships in your life. Verse 4, and he reasoned in the synagogue every Sabbath, which was what day? Saturday. Yeah, not Sunday. Because he's, he's, he's not doing church. What is he doing? He's going into the synagogue to minister to the Jews who, who are not Christians. Okay, they're, they're, they're still walking in, in Judaism. So Paul's not going to church. He's going on the mission field. He's going into the synagogue on Saturday. Now, Paul... Um, well, let me finish verse 4. And tried to persuade Jews and Greeks. So this is what Paul's doing. He's, his missionary strategy was he's using what he's got. He's using the deck of cards he's been given, which is that he was a very um, well-known and affluential Pharisee, which was kind of the, the, the head haunches of the, Pharise- or of the Judaism at the time. So he rolls into a town, and, and guess where he can get immediate audience? At a synagogue. He can walk into a synagogue, and they'll let, him, they'll let him talk. They'll let him speak. And so this is what he does. Now, what I want you to see here is that Paul was a weekend warrior. He was a weekend. You know what a weekend warrior is? That, you, know, you have, like, like, people that get paid to do things, and then you have people that just do it when they, when they can, when they have free time, right? Uh, Paul spent the best hours of his day making tents. And then on the weekends, he's planting a church. On the weekends and on the evenings and whenever he has free time, he's, he's going. Now, why do I want you to see that? I want you to see that because I think there's this lie uh, that we often allow um, to, to affect us or keep us from ministry that says, you know what, I just don't have the time. I just don't have the time to do ministry. I don't have time to do discipleship. Maybe when my kids are grown, maybe when I'm retired, you know, I got a job and working 60 hours a week. You know, the kids have sports, it's soccer, it's this, 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 and this. Um, I don't have time to, to make disciples. That's completely a lie. That's completely a lie. Paul, I just want you to see this. The apostle Paul had a nine to five. He worked. And guess what he did with his free time? He made disciples. He ministered the gospel. What a great example. And he did that on purpose. He did that on purpose because not that there was anything wrong with taking a paycheck. He actually says it's okay to take a paycheck uh, for ministry. But he said, I'm doing that because I don't want to cause anyone to question my motives. I just, he's like, I want everyone to know I'm doing this because I love Jesus, I love the gospel, and that's my only motive. So I'm going to raise my own funds, I'm going to make my own way, and I'm going to just plant churches on the weekends. I love that. 
So number three, if you want to write it down, the third way to burn out is don't believe God can work on your weekends. Another way to say it, don't believe God can, can work with what's left over. Don't believe he can work with the, with, the, with the time that you do have. Maybe you've got 15 minutes. Maybe you have two hours on Saturday morning to go and meet with somebody and try to encourage them. Maybe you only have a Friday evening to grab a few guys and get around a campfire and just pray for one another. Whatever it is, use what you have. Minister with what you have, but build the kingdom of God. Verse 5. When Silas and Timothy arrived, now this is his ministry team. Remember I said he left them behind? His ministry team is now caught up with him. They arrived from Macedonia, that's where Philippi was, northern Greece. And Paul was occupied, I love this, Paul was occupied with the word. Let that be said of me. <laughs> occupied with the word, I love it. He's busy with the word, with the gospel. That's what the word means there. It's the good news, the euangelion, the declaration that Jesus Christ is God, come in human flesh, died, rose, ascended, is victorious. That, that's what Paul spent his time, his life, every breath, every thought declaring was the gospel. He was a gospel guy. And his team shows up, right? And they're like, oh, there's Paul. What is he doing? He's ministering the gospel. That's what Paul did. That's what Paul did. That's what we should be doing. So Silas Timothy arrived from Macedonia. Paul was occupied with the word, testifying to the Jews. Notice he's ministering to the Jews. Uh, that the Christ was Jesus. Here's my paraphrase, of, my paraphrase of that. Paul is ministering to the Jews that Jesus is the answer they've been looking for. Okay? Because when it says Christ, what does that mean? Messiah. What does Messiah mean? Messiah is the one the Jews have been waiting for. The whole Jewish religion is like, is like bent around this expectation that this guy is going to come and he's going to be the answer to all of the things that we need. And so, G so Paul is there testifying and saying, hey guys, I have good news. We know who that person is. He came. His name was Jesus. He died on a cross. He paid for our sin. And guess what? He backed it up with power. He rose. He ascended to the right hand of the Father. He sent his spirit. You can have that spirit. This is the good news. This is what Paul was ministering. He's trying to get the Jews to see that the Old Testament anticipation, it's all found its culmination in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, he's going to the Jews partly because they already have a foundation. What do I mean by that? They already believe in the Old Testament. They have a presupposition that God has in fact spoke, that Yahweh did re, re, uh, deliver his law to, to Moses. They have, a, they have a very good foundation. But as we're going to see here, Paul's not having a lot of success with these guys. They're very blind to the gospel. So um, verse 6, and when they opposed, that is the Jews, when they opposed and reviled him, he shook out his garments, that's a, a Jewish thing, uh, I don't know what it looks like exactly, but he, it's sort of this like insult, it's kind of this insulting way to go like, yeah, I'm done. I'm done with you guys, okay? Shakes out his garments, uh, said to them, your blood be on your own heads. I am innocent. From now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So Paul's been starting with the Jews. God had a particular calling, you know, this on Paul's life to minister to the Gentiles. And Paul is starting to edge closer and closer to that calling. He's, he's had it with the Jews. He's ministered the gospel. He's told them the truth. They're not listening. They're rejecting him. They're even hostile to him. And so he says, forget it. I'm moving on to the Gentiles. And a Gentile is just a non-Jewish person. And he left there and went to the house of a man named Titius Justus, a worshiper of God. What is a worshiper of God? A worshiper of God actually is shorthand for a Gentile who worshiped Yahweh. Okay. A Gentile, meaning someone who has not been circumcised, someone who's not born ethnically Jewish, but yet acknowledged that Yahweh was God and, and, and was worshiping actively. So remember in Acts chapter 16, remember Lydia? Lydia was a worshiper of God. They were also called God-fearers. Okay, so this is a non-ethnically Jewish person who worships the God of the Jews, the, the God of, of the Old Covenant, the God of the Bible. And so uh, Paul now sees a conversion with this man, Titius Justice, who was a, a, a Gentile God-fearer. And his house was next door to the synagogue. I love this. Paul's in the synagogue. He's just like bedrock. Like there's just no penetrating with the gospel. He's putting the shovel into the dirt, and it's just clunk, 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 clunk. And then he moves it three inches to the left, and the shovel goes right in. He goes next door from the synagogue. 
and instantly sees the first convert that we're aware of here in Corinth. His house was next door to the synagogue. Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue, uh, and now ru- ruler, don't think, don't think like pastor. They were just the one uh, in charge of managing the, the state of the synagogue. Um, believed in the Lord together with his entire house, and many of the Corinthians, hearing Paul, believed and were baptized. So this is exciting, guys. This is the moment. I'm a church planner, so I get excited about this stuff. This is the moment where Paul is starting to see the gospel bring supernatural, born-again life. And the seed of the gospel is now bringing life out. And, and, and now, what, what are we starting to see? We're starting to see a community form. We're starting to see that the gospel's bringing transformation. And now, we have this new organism called the church at Corinth, made up of Titius uh, Justice and made up of Crispus and Crispus' household. And we're beginning to see this, the very, the very first inklings of a church. And now these guys would start meeting on Sunday because that's Resurrection Day. And, and they would begin to do church life together. And, 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 and Paul would be starting to raise up elders to feed the sheep the gospel and to, to work and, and, and begin to, to bring more people into the kingdom of God. This is very exciting. But what I want you to see here, number, number four, if you want to write it down, fourth way to burn out is to stay rigid in your approach. Don't see God's plan at work. Just keep working your plan. So what I love about this, now Paul had a plan. He had a paradigm. He had his way of ministry was he he rolls in, he goes to the synagogue, he ministers to the Jews. He did that and it didn't work. So what did he do? Did he go, no, it's my plan. My plan has to work. It's all about my plan. No, he he surrendered to that and he said, you know what, I'm going to move the shovel shovel three inches to the left. I'm going to go minister to the Gentiles. I just think there's an important point there about staying flexible. You know, a lot of times when we get frustrated in our ministry or in discipleship is we're trying to do what worked last year. We're trying to do with what worked with one kid. We're trying to do what worked with another situation. And we're so committed to the strategy that we're not willing to give it up for where God might be showing favor in another area. So I just think we need to offer, we need to ask hard questions of our strategies, you know, and, and, we, and we need to be willing to stay flexible. You know, God's not working in this area. Maybe you should move three inches to the right and like maybe God's wanting to work in this area. I love that, that Paul was willing to sort of abandon his strategy and stay uh, to stay flexible. Um, you, you guys know probably this story. It's, it's, I don't know if it's legend or reality, but um, you know, the Jesus movement when all of the, the, the hippies were coming in and, uh, and apparently one of um, the deacons or elders came up to, to Chuck and they were like, hey man, like, we gotta ask these guys to wear shoes because they're, like, they're thrashing our new carpet. You know? and, and, uh, and Chuck, I guess, was like, rip out the carpet. You know, it's like, hello, you know, uh, hello, rip out the carpet. And I love, I love it here because I think that's kind of what Paul's doing. He's just like, let's, let's, just, let's just try something a little different. When Jesus talked about the kingdom, he said the kingdom comes in new wineskins. That means the kingdom comes in the spaces where we're not so rigid. And, and by rigid, I, think, I don't think that means rigid in our theology. Or we, we should be rigid in our theology. But not rigid in our practice. Not rigid in our how not, not rigid in, in exactly how we do things. Um, it, it's, it's important to stay pliable. Let's keep moving. Verse 9. The Lord said to Paul one night in a vision. Now, let me, let me, let me pause there for a moment, give you some background. So, so this is cool. Paul's discouraged. He's frustrated. He's having a hard time. They're seeing some fruit in Corinth, but he knows there's going to be opposition. Jesus shows up to Paul in a vision. This is super cool. And here's what he says to him. He says, Paul, do not be afraid, but go on speaking. And do not be silent, for I am with you. And no one will attack you to harm you. For I have many in this city who are my people. Let's kind of break that down a little bit. If you reverse engineer what Jesus just said, you'll find out some areas that Paul was discouraged in. First area Paul was discouraged in was that I think that Paul was starting to question uh, his preaching and, and possibly even the power of the gospel. I think he was starting to question it. Have you ever, have you ever had that? You know, I mean, you're, you're, you're faithfully reminding whoever of the love of God and, 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 the, and the kindness of God and the grace of God and the mercy of God, and you just feel like, man, it's just hitting bedrock. It's just, hit, it's just like pinging off of a rock. It's not penetrating their heart. And then you start to question, like, well, maybe... Maybe I should try something else. Maybe I should say something else. I think Paul was starting to maybe question a little bit the efficacy of the message of the gospel. And so what does Jesus come to do? He comes and he says, Paul, he says, look at me, Paul, keep 
preaching the gospel. Just keep doing it. Keep preaching it. Because because if if you hear one thing this morning, listen to this. Because the power to save is in the gospel. You understand that the gospel is not a call to morality. It's not a call to a certain lifestyle. It's not a call to, uh, it, it may have some of that downstream. What is the gospel? The gospel is news. It's a declaration of something that took place. It's a declaration that Jesus has taken the throne of the universe and that he has provided a way of salvation. And when you put that seed in the ground, it is powerful. The Greek word dynamis, it's dynamic, it's dynamite, it's powerful. So Jesus comes to Paul, and what does he tell him? What's the first thing out of him? Paul, don't stop preaching the gospel. Some of you guys are starting to question because you've been doing it for years with a particular person. I know, I talk to all of you guys. I keep telling this person, I keep telling them about Jesus, I keep telling them about the love of God, I just keep throwing it out, and they just don't care. Okay, listen, the issue is not the seed. The issue is the soil. Jesus said that so clearly. He said, look, there's all kinds of different places that the seed of the gospel can land. There's a place that it can get choked out. There's a place that it can just bounce right off. There's a place where it can get scorched or eaten. Uh, and there's really one type of soil. But the problem is not the seed. The problem is the soil. So what do we do? We just keep throwing the seed. Where do I get this idea that the gospel is the power of God? Well, it's, it's right in Scripture, Romans 1.16. If you guys uh, remember it, Paul said, I am not ashamed of the gospel. For it is the power of God to salvation, or for salvation, to everyone who believes. It's the power of God. It's a salvation. So, number five, if you want to burn out in ministry, write this down. Lose confidence in the gospel. And let the fear of rejection stop you from speaking it. That's the fifth way. It can be tempting to question the efficacy of the seed, but it's not the seed of the gospel. It could be that you could tweak your approach a little bit. That's probably likely. You could probably get a little better. You could probably become a little more gospel fluent. Um, and you could probably be a little more clear maybe on what the gospel is. But, but the problem is, is always the soil. Now, the second thing that, that we see Paul was discouraged in here based on what Jesus tells him is Paul, I think, was starting to question the presence of God in his tribulation. He's starting to question whether Jesus was really there and present. Why do I think that? Because Jesus says, don't be afraid. Keep on speaking. Don't be silent. And then he says what? I am with you. I think he told Paul that because I think Paul was starting to ask this question. Lord, are you with me? I'm getting the snot beat out of me. This is hard. This is, this is discouraging. Are you with me? Are you present? And to, to, to which Christ affirms what he's already said. He already told the disciples, behold, I'm with you the end of the, even unto the end of the age. But Christ shows up to affirm this very important truth. I know this is basic. This is fundamental. This is elemental. You need to hear it, okay? He shows up to tell Paul this very important thing, and that is, I am with you. Not, I will be with you when I return. No, I am with you. Christ's presence is bodily here. How, Sam? How is Christ's presence bodily here? Okay, two ways. Spirit of God and the body of Christ, both of which are present right now. In fact, the Spirit of God exists within the body of Christ. You know, when you sit, I told, this morning we had a time of prayer, and afterwards I told the Christ, I said, thank you guys so much for taking the time, because we took about an hour, and we went around, and we each just shared what's going on in our life, how we could be prayed for, and I told everybody afterwards, I said, thank you for being the manifest presence of Jesus for each other this morning. So when you're with the body, Christ is present through the physical presence of the body of believers. He is with us. His presence is with us. His sovereign rule is over us. His spirit is in us. So number six, if you want to burn out, assume God is not with you in your fears and discouragements. Just assume that. Revelation chapter one, we see Jesus. Where is Jesus in Revelation chapter one? He's in the midst of the lampstands, in which we later find out the lampstands are what? The church. He's present. He's here. I wonder how different church would look for us if we just really acted like Christ was present every week. You know, like he, he's here. The Spirit of God is present because the body is here. 
Two or more are gathered. We are living stones. The presence of God is here. Jesus is here. He's within his body. The third thing I think that um, Paul was discouraged in is I think Paul was starting to put the burden of conversion on his own incapable shoulders. And the reason I think that is because what, is, what does Jesus say to him? He says, again, in verse 10, for, um, he says, for I have many, I have many in this city who are my people. Notice he doesn't say, Paul, you have many people in this city who are your people. He says, I have many in this city that are my people. Now, what's, what's Jesus talking about? I think he's talking about converts. I think he's talking about future people that he's going to call into the kingdom, people that he has already bought and paid for, people that he has already sovereignly elected that are in Corinth that just haven't yet come into that body. He's like, don't worry, Paul. I'm working something way bigger than you're even aware of. I got a lot of my people that are coming into this kingdom. And we need to remember that when we do ministry because we get discouraged when we start to think, I am the one that has to make this happen, and they're my people. No, they're not, and no, you can't. Only Christ can. They're his people. So number seven, write it down, seventh way to burn out. Assume you can save people because they are your people. No, you can't, and no, they're not. They are Christ's. That's probably like one of the most, like the, the lesson I have to learn more than any lesson in ministry as a pastor I have to make this happen. I have to see this person change. I have to help this person. I have to make this, I have to keep this person. Like, and Jesus constantly has to remind, hey, you dork, they're not your people. You can't make it happen. You're just a sheep. Get back in line. They're his sheep, right? Praise God for that. So, number eight, one more thing here. If you want to burn out, don't see the bigger picture of God's sovereign work in people's lives. I think one of the reasons a lot of times that Christians get burned out in ministry is because we're only, we're hyper-focused or hyper-fixated on a couple of areas and we're not seeing things happen in that. This is why I encourage Christians to go on mission trips. I mean, you get out of your 97526 or 97527 or whatever your zip code is, you get out of it and you go to another country and you're like, holy cow, God is working over here. Like there's people that love Jesus all the way in this other country. Like the kingdom of God is so far and so wide and so deep and so broad and the gospel is moving in the nations. God is being glorified in the nations. It's super exciting. So if, if you start to think like, God, I'm not sure if you're working, like you need to get out of your zip code and you need to see Jesus at work in the nations because he is. So uh, Jesus is encouraging Paul here. He's saying, hey, look, I have many people beyond your, uh, your peripherals, Paul. There's a lot more going on than you are even aware of. Verse 11, let's finish it up here. Verse 11, and he stayed a year and six months. I, I want you to note that. That's a long time. He'd already been here for some time. So he stayed in Corinth a year and six months. What does that tell us? It tells us there was a lot of work to do. And here's what we know, okay? Uh, homework assignment for you guys. Uh, go home and read 1 Corinthians. Here's what you're going to find. The work wasn't done. The church at Corinth was jacked. This was, it's been called the R-rated church. I mean, these guys had problems. They had all kinds of issues. Sexual immorality, the, they, they, they had all kinds of issues in their theology and their practice and the way they were gathering. They were selfish. They were, they were picking out of the communion table. They were getting drunk in the communion. There was a guy that was having a relationship with his, his, his dad's wife. It was just really a mess. It was really a mess. And Paul had to spend a year and a half just to get it to the point where it was a mess. And then he had to keep going and, and write letters back and try to correct some of the issues that were going on. That's what First and Second Corinthians are all about. And Paul was constantly having to, to, to tell them why he um, had authority as an apostle because they were constantly bucking at his authority and they were constantly not taking him seriously because other people were coming into the church. This was the, the messiness of Corinth. Now, what's my point? My point is that ministry is messy. Life change takes time. It's not quick. It's not easy. It's hard takes a lot of time. So number nine, if you want to burn out in ministry, just expect life change to happen quickly and easily. It just doesn't work that way. Paul spent a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. Now let's, let's close it out here. Verse 12. But when uh, Galileo was proconsul of Achaia, the Jews made a united attack on Paul. 
and brought him before the tribunal. What that means is, is that all the Jews from all these different um, cities, uh, all these, you know, these Judaizers were coming together and they were basically saying, hey, we all hate Paul. We all hate this gospel message that he's bringing. Let's all put our chips together and let's just get rid of him once for all. So, uh, so again, ministry is discouraging. All these people are against him. They go to the proconsul who was sort of the Roman governor at the time and they're like, let's see if we can get this guy uh, to take out Paul for us. Now, verse 13 saying, this man is persuading people to worship God contrary to the law, which is not true. But when Paul was about to open his mouth, uh, Galileo said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or a vicious crime, O Jews, I would have reason to accept your complaint. But since it is a matter of questions about words and names and your own law, see to it yourselves. I refuse to be a judge of these things. And he drove them from the tribunal and they all seized Sosthenes. Now, isn't that interesting? Why didn't they seize Paul? Because Jesus said, you're not getting beat up today, Paul. Remember that? He just said it. He said, Paul, you're not getting beat up today. Paul would get beat up again later. But Christ specifically said, hey, buddy, sit down. You're good. You're not going to get beat up in Corinth. <sighs> Great. So who gets beat up instead? Poor Sosthenes, right? Uh, poor Sosthenes. He gets the beating. They seized Sosthenes and the ruler of the synagogue, and they beat him in front of the tribunal. But Galileo paid no attention to any of us. Now, I just want to make one last point here, and then we'll close. Okay, so even with the tangible encouragement of the Lord, stuff was still hard. This is hard stuff. We just have no idea what life would be like like this. You know, like our, our worst case scenario is like, you know, your, your broista is like making your coffee and, and they're like, you know, hey, what are you doing? You're like, oh, I'm going to church. And they're like, oh, cool. Like what church do you go to? And you're like, I go to Philippi. Hey, Jesus loves you. And they're like, nah, I'm good. And you're like, oh, persecution. Welcome to, to persecution in Grants Pass, like 2023. No. No. Now, I know, I know that some of you guys have probably had more close to real persecution, so I don't want to belittle that. But, but in reality, um, these guys, they, they, they were literally hostily attacked. And, and you know what? They kept preaching. They didn't keep preaching out of burden or, or legalism or guilt or shame or fear. Uh, they kept preaching because the gospel was so good. Such good news for them. They had to share it. Christ was so real to them. So they just kept, they kept at it. They kept planting churches. They kept ministering. So number 10, if you want to burn out in ministry, just don't expect persecution and put your hope in this world and its leaders to protect you. That's a mistake. Okay, clearly the, the governmental leaders here didn't, didn't step up and, and do justice like they should have. The reality is we're in a spiritual war. Um, we have an active enemy that hates us and uh, controls this, the governmental systems that we live within. Okay, so the, the, that, that's, the, that's a reality. We need to have a wartime mentality and our, 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 our battle is with the message of the gospel. So let me conclude here. Uh, first of all, let me review in case you didn't get them all written down. So here's 10 ways to burn out in ministry. Number one, don't see the redemptive potential of your space that you've been placed in. Number two, don't surround yourself with Christ's community partnerships, Aquila and Priscilla. Number three, don't believe God can work on your weekends. Number four, stay rigid in your approach don't see God's plan at work. Just keeping your, keep working your plan. Five, lose confidence in the gospel. Let the fear of rejection stop you from speaking it. Six, assume God is not with you in your fears and discouragements. Seven, assume you can save people because they are your people. Eight, don't see the bigger picture of God's sovereign work in people's lives. Nine, expect life change to happen quickly and easily. And 10, don't expect persecution and put your hope in this world and its leaders to protect you. So if you really wanted to burn out this week, I've given you 10 ways to do that. And, uh, and yeah, I'm, I'm joking. Here, here's, a, here's a conclusion. Um, I want to end with Paul's words to the Galatians. Here's what he said to the church in, in, in Galatia. He said, uh, in Galatians 6, 9, he said, and let us not grow weary of doing good. He said, for in due season, we will reap if we do not give up. So then, as we have opportunity, let us do good to everyone, especially to those who are of the household of faith. Simple. This morning's sermon is not deep. It's not theological. It's simple, okay? Um, don't grow weary, okay? Keep it up. Keep ministering the gospel. Keep telling your kids. Keep telling your coworkers. Keep telling your friends. Keep telling your mom. Keep telling your dad. Keep telling your cousin. 
Um, the message of the gospel is powerful. It's dynamic. Keep putting it out there. My friend Rick Boya, uh, he uses this analogy. I love it. He uses it all the time. It's, he, he said, church and ministry, it's, it's not like topiary. He doesn't know what topiary is. Topiary is uh, where you take a hedge that's kind of like big and burly, and you take those like hedge clippers and you shape it into something. So a lot of people think of church like that, or they think of life change like that, or they think of discipleship like that. Okay, I'm going to take this person, I'm going to sculpt them into who I want them to be. But that's not what ministry looks like. Ministry looks like fruit trees, according to Jesus. What do we know about fruit trees? Well, most of the year, it doesn't look like they're doing anything. It takes a lot of time, it takes a lot of pruning, and they're really messy. We had a plum tree when I was a kid in my backyard. The thing was a mess. There's just like a carpet of plums on the ground, you know, for, for like three months out of the year. It was just such a mess. It's messy. It's sticky. It doesn't come how you want and when you want. All you're doing is you're pruning and you're watering and you're expecting because it's an organic thing that's happening. Ministry happens in organic life. It doesn't, it's not me coming in and, and synthesizing and manipulating a situation to make somebody the way I want them to be. That's not where the Spirit of God works. The Spirit of God works in the mess. He works through the gospel. He works through time. He works by patience. And he wants to work through you. Amen? Amen. Let's all stand together. Jesus, thank you that you came into this world to reconcile it back to yourself. Thank you that uh, you didn't leave us stuck in our own sin, unable to pay for it, unable to fix ourselves. Rather, Jesus, you transcended into your creation, became part of it, and died for us within it. That Jesus, you have been victorious over death and over sin and over the enemy, and that uh, we are in this middle place of waiting for your return. Jesus, thank you for the church. Thank you for the bride that you purchased, that you washed, that you cleansed, and that you called to be part of your kingdom purpose and your kingdom mission. Thank you for church planting. Thank you for salvation. Thank you for stories like Acts chapter 18. Thank you for people like Aquila and Priscilla. And God, I pray that you would bring Aquilas and Priscillas around each one of these people. Lord, that you would bring partnerships, gospel partnerships, mission partnerships. God, I pray, Jesus, that just like you encouraged Paul, that you would encourage us this week, that you would remind us, Lord, of your presence, that you would remind us of the power of the gospel, that we don't need to be ashamed of it. We just got to keep speaking it. I thank you so much, Jesus, that you are the king, that you are sovereign, that you are seated. All power and authority is yours. And the only reason you're not showing up right now and setting up your new physical administration is because you're saving people out of the darkness. So God, use us to be part of that saving. Lord, we thank you for this place, this, our, our very own Corinth, God, and all of its problems and all of its issues and all of its immorality. Lord, we thank you for the state of Oregon and all of its brokenness and all of its sinfulness because, God, we see opportunity there because, Jesus, you are way bigger than the problems in the darkness of our culture. God, would you use us as beachheads, as kingdom outposts to bring light and life and change and discipleship into this world. God, could we flip our culture upside down, Lord, by discipleship, by transforming lives, seeing people set free from sin and from darkness, from evil. I thank you for Philippi. God, thank you for these believers. We pray, Lord, that you've also met uh, the rest of us up at the lake as well. And God, as we go on our way, Lord, we love you. We thank you. In Jesus' name.